Good evening. Today is the 26th day of December 2016, and we are continuing with our explorations in Savitri with dear Alok Bai. We are in uh, Book 2, Canto 6. Book 2 is the book of the traveler of the worlds. Aswapati is going through all these kingdoms. And this is, these are the kingdoms now, kingdoms and godheads of the greater life. For those of you who have books, it's page 179, about the center of the page. Four by the form. Yes. The formless is brought close. I have often heard people say that death is a mystery. But I feel birth is a greater mystery. Birth means something which forms. That's how originally birth is defined. Birth is not just this human birth, but, but birth is entering into a state of limitation into a form. Through a form, the infinite limits itself. Death is a natural consequence of that. So the first mystery is birth. Uh, another thing is very often we, we think that life is opposite of death. But opposite of death is not life but birth. If at all we have to you know, use the word opposite. In the divine sense, in the divine harmony, there are no opposites but uh, complementarities. But here we experience them as either or. So life continues even after death of the body. It continues on other planes with a different kind of experience, different sense organization, different kind of even mentation. And then it goes on and on till it touches that supreme height. So this is uh, where you know we have an understanding of life, not just the processes of life. Processes of life are simply one kind of device that nature has created for its purpose. But it can create another device, another process. So we should, processes are important to understand how it works, but not why it is there and what is its purpose. It's like with anything. Initially, you see, we had those radios which were, you know, big ones. And mm -hmm. I still remember listening to the commentary. Oh yes. <laughs> oh yes. Now the same thing is transmitted in a different way, picked up in you know microchips, and you can actually even see it, not just hear it. Yeah. So new devices have come up to relay the same thing. So life is ever busy with creating new and new devices. And what is it trying to do? It is trying to manifest something which it has glimpsed, felt deep within. So it is trying to create all kinds of things on every plane to bring some semblance, to catch the formless into form, to catch the eternal in the flow of time. And that is a big challenge. And uh, they, are, they are very beautiful lines which are going to follow. But first those three lines where we had stopped. It is near to heavenlier heavens. Then earth's eyes see. A direr darkness than man's life can bear. So our life moves in a very narrow range. And we think this is life. Like, you know, with light. We think that limits of our sight is the limit of light. But scientists will tell us that there is light in different frequencies existing beyond our uh, capacity to see. Just as there are sounds which are inaudible. Something is coming to you. <laughs> well, it's about Sri Aurobindo's <laughs> statement on darkness. Yeah. That, that there is no darkness. There is no darkness. There is only light. Yes. Because God is everywhere. Yeah. And where God is, there, there is, is light. light. And the mother gave something very similar and interesting. She said, after everybody deliberated on death, and each one wrote a kind of a mini thesis. So, last was mother's comment. And mother gave a short and sweet comment. In fact, there is no death. In fact, there is no death. There is only life. And he says, no. our sense, mm -hmm. by its incapacity, has invented darkness. Yes, 
Yes, it's in capacity. That's it. Yeah. So we move in a narrow range and therefore we think this is the limit of reality. But it's not the limit of reality. It is only our first contact, an imperfect contact through an imperfect consciousness of reality. But as we increase and expand the range or as it increases and expands due to either natural evolution over a period of time or through a concentrated evolution called yoga, we begin to become aware of things which are beyond and things which are below. And there too there is life. That's the beauty of it. And what is life doing there? That we will see. A direr darkness than man's life can bear. It has kinship with the demon and the god. It a strange enthusiasm has moved its heart. This is the characteristic movement of life. Enthusiasm, will, joy, force. This is its natural movement. But then we see also in life its opposite. So what they are we will discover. But right now it is enthusiasm. It hungers for heights. It passions for the supreme. It hunts for the perfect word. The perfect shape. It leaps to the summit thought. The summit light. For by the form, the formless is brought close. And all perfection fringes the absolute. See, this is the irony and this in a way is the cause of our agony also. So mother says at one place that to want a perfect person in relationship to yourself is to want a personal divine. Because we want everything perfect, perfect, perfect. It is the nature of life to seek perfection. But wherever the problem is, the solution is also there. So the perfection is within us. And we want to find it outside, to look at it outside. But it's within us. And when we discover within ourselves, then perhaps much that we today understand as imperfection will be a perfection in the making. So it will change our perspective. I remember that early story from Sat Prem, The Adventure of Consciousness, where the man goes around to all people and he says, Have you seen God? Have you seen yes. God? And he's never satisfied. And then he says one day, Ah, oh, he is here. here, here and then is. he realizes. Yes, here he is. Yeah. So it is in search for that. And now we have these marvelous lines mm. A child of heaven who never saw his home. So when people use the word, you know, there are orphanages and when we use the word orphan, actually this is a very misleading word. At one level, nobody is an orphan because there is the divine inside and he will find a way. He will figure out. Something or the other will happen, you know, that story of Shakuntala in Indian thought. You can't imagine that the ancient name of India is Bharatvarsh. And you know, you know the name, how does Bharat come from? Where does it come from? It comes from a child called Bharat. And who was Bharat? Bharat was born to Shakuntala and Dushyant. They are married and you know he forgets and goes away and it's a very interesting story. But And who is Shakuntala? She is born of Vishwamitra uh, and a heavenly damsel, Menaka. And both abandon the child the moment she is born. This fellow thinks my tapasya has gone off so he goes into Tapasya and this lady says, oh, I have not come down for this and she goes off to heaven. So this little child is guarded by a, by a bird and the name of the bird is Shakun. So that's how the name comes, Shakuntala. She grows up. But look at the ways of destiny that this child will become the grand, grand, grand mother of the entire clan of great hero warriors which would include, you know, a whole lineage of Kauravas, Pandavas and what not. So look uh, how destiny can play, you know. So none is an orphan. At the same time, till we have found our heavenly home, we are all homeless. We, we really, you know, and that's why we want to have or believe that this home will be heaven. You know, every bride that comes into a new home starts believing it's a heaven. <laughs> and... <laughs> Then she discovers it's not such a heaven. <laughs> then she wants to create a heaven out there. So this is how 
the story goes of all our lives a child of heaven life life is its origin is the divine so that's why it can be transmuted into a life divine this is the fundamental uh, essential truth that should have been the reveals not that life is an illusion life is something which is fallen life is accursed life is a delusion life is a illusion no in its origin it is divine and therefore it can be transmuted back to its original truth this is a fundamental um, axiom if you want to put it in shurbindo's thought yes. so shurbindo says a child of heaven who never saw his home this of course is about the greater life because it has wandered into the territories of ignorance its impetus meets the eternal at a point it can only near and touch it cannot hold it can only strain towards some bright extreme its greatness is to seek and to create it's a marvelous line yes. so in modern psychology i you know one may think it's all abstract you know it's very very practical and i'll tell you how it's practical it's it, it should be applied in everyday life so all of us within us there is a there is this uh, life which is wanting to find its heaven which it has strayed away from and it is seeking that so wherever we go in whatever way like parents you know heavenly home so in our parents we want to actually see a prototype of the heavenly parent so we expect our mothers to be perfect in their patience and our fathers to be perfect in their understanding and our friend and beloved and husband and wife to be perfect 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 but it never finds why because it has to create it now look at the the other day we were saying that on earth there is nothing like a ready lunch you have to make it or someone has to make it for you so you seek and you create and the whole effort of life is to create now this creation will reach a point depending on you know what degree you can go on and yet you want to create still further because you are ever dissatisfied no this is not it something else, something more there is something left and this anguish of life leads to so much sorrow suffering pain and until we understand this anguish in its real sense we cannot find the lasting remedy those two great lines that i always recall like a child's soul yes. left at the gates of hell fumbling One, through, through fog, fog in search, in search of, of paradise. paradise yes oh this is our life and that's why simply manipulating outer circumstances doesn't help you're going to speak about psychology yes so this is it on every plane this greatness must create so we should not live under the illusion that life is only as we experience it or as we experience in the material world there is life even in matter once your window makes this remark when he said flowers have a soul so the disciple says what sir flowers have a soul we never knew it <laughs> your window says next you will say you will laugh when i say that watches have life you know it's a very interesting remark and with shurbindo's life we see that when he physically withdrew all the three watches stopped at that point of time yeah at 126 all the three watches have stopped morning and he knew it and now it has deeper ramification it's not only about watches you know some people believe that probably machines have life it won't be yes it won't be surprising and this you know search for artificial intelligence the famous recent one is zarvik or a something similar to zarvik which facebook founder has created mark zuckerberg he has created this uh, robo who can communicate with him little bit through artificial intelligence so possibly there is already a rudiment of consciousness consciousness is obviously there and even a rudiment of life which is using this tool as a kind of toy just as life uses us these machines so it opens a whole world of possibilities on earth in heaven in hell she is the same she seeks and she creates she finds and she loses everywhere of every fate 
she takes her mighty part and that's why one reason for death is because in its deepest essence life is infinite and it wants to have infinite experiences on a finite basis so not possible so you die you take a new body you have another kind of experience oh, you remember that which you once mentioned the story bithoven being a shoemaker in his next life yes so it seeks different kind of experiences because then it will discover its totality on every plane in every way of every fate yeah. not just victory but also the experience of fall the experience of failure life must experience everything a guardian of the fire that lights the suns she triumphs in her glory and her might opposed oppressed she bears god's arch to be born so we see this height and the abyss on one side on its peaks she is the guardian of the fire if you read one of the upanishads prashna upanishad the one of the questions a very interesting upanishad of six questions so one of the questions is with regard to who is the greatest godhead so in the vedas they talk about fire agni but rishi pipalad speaks of vayu breath it fans the fire it becomes the fire of course a very profound yes. whole number of passages so on its heights life is that it's the breath of god which fans the fire nourishes us wow. so it's you know we use this expression breath of god it's it's a very well known phrase and we have virat yes who lights his campfires Fires. in the sun yes we'll have that also yes, coming coming up. but at the same time the same life it's not a different life can be oppressed opposed and yet within her is the urge for god to be born so we see this in story of again krishna the parents are opposed and oppressed and put in a jail with the demon sitting with a sword right on their chest but in their heart there is the urge for god to be born and he is born so you know everywhere it has that but the same god who is born here in an opposed and oppressed state is the same godhead who dwells there as the supreme lord so this you know in one sense we can see the whole range yes. Yes. on one side is the supreme lord on one other side it is such a painful birth under what circumstance and we see it in the history of all avatars yes. yesterday was christmas so you see the birth of christ yes. born in a manger i mean nobody knows and crucified but yet at another level he is the supreme who has taken a human body so you know this is the beauty of the power of life this spirit survives upon non beings ground world force outlasts world disillusions shock hmm. this is a interesting story about it one is a small story where a man is saying oh it's better that i die and suddenly death appears and says you were looking for me well who are you i am death no 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 sir i don't want to die but you just mentioned i want to die so you know this we may say in a in a certain state and this is another more beautiful story it's a more mystic story this of course a partly humorous story that someone someone goes to meet kabir saint kabir and he is not there at his home so he knocks the door and his daughter comes out and she says yes whom do you want to meet i want to meet the great mystic kabir i've heard a lot about him so he says well dad has gone to a funeral and you go there and you will meet him so how do i recognize him no cell phones no special attire everybody is more or less wearing dhoti and so he says very simple you look at them you will see Uh, behind him a glow of sun so he says oh is it so he goes there now he sees a glow of sun behind everyone so he is confused so he says what is this but as they start moving away it begins to drop off one after another and only in one person this glow remains so he says are you kabir yes i am kabir now of course this story has two senses it is told in the traditional yoga as a sense of 
illusion about life but it's not about illusion it's about discovering the reality behind life that's my interpretation but traditional people won't like it so they say look he had vairagya so everybody when uh-huh. they go to a funeral they develop the vairagya they are disillusion and therefore they temporarily by the shock of these world forces and death they feel this is nothing but in that nothing they feel something which is present something like a presence divine presence something which is uh, there as you know uh, which inhabits even a dead form that's why we do pranam even to a dead body in india and everywhere there is a custom but as they begin to move most of them get back into the routine and some retain that state of experience of reality so here we have a beautiful line that world force outlast world disillusion shock for a moment you are you are disillusion oh life is meaningless it's wasted and if people can go through a critical period in their life you have to just support them through that journey a little more little more and then you will see that something else will come the world force and its shock will draw them back into life and slowly that event will fade away because this is the power of life it will just draw you back into itself dumb she is still the word inert the par i'd like to say something about this word dumb because i've spoken at length with amal kiran about this um dumb for us is a colloquialism that has no meaning dumb is always silent in savitri and there are dozens and dozens of lines with the word dumb and it always means silent very true. important very true dumb matter yes. dumb earth's need earth's dumb needs yes. yes something which is unexpressed yes remains. dumb she is still the word inert the power so we have this famous um, image of shiva lying inert and on his breast there is the dance of kali taking place even in death there is life but it is only changed its mode it has gone into a state of inertia disintegration so this is the here fallen a slave of death and ignorance to things deathless she is driven to aspire and move to know even the unknowable the divine is unknowable because we cannot know him by the mind we can know him only through other faculties and through a process of identification but we cannot put him into words any definition which has rigid boundaries we lose him because it's infinite by its very nature and yet life wants to capture life wants to know life seeks even in this state even in the fallen state even nascent null her sleep creates a world we all know this you know anybody who is you know uh, conscious of the dreams knows that even in a state of sleep we are all the time creating forms and experiences uh, speaking of dumb <laughs> you know before you come there is a pregnant silence because we are all <laughs> waiting for the celestial messenger <laughs> <laughs> narad <laughs> now i am sure we are silent outwardly but lot is happening inside <laughs> we may be concentrating on the divine aspiring on the divine or we may be lost in our experiences of the day we may be planning for something tomorrow various things you can't stop it you can only divert it you can channelize it you can purify it you can refine it you can transform it everything possible but if you want life to stop well no it doesn't work out so every where it is on every plane and these mighty lines next yes yes these are when most unseen yes when most unseen most mightily she works housed in the atom buried in the clod her quick creative passion cannot cease and look what it 
it creates out of the dumb atom countless 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 billions of objects hanging in space all made out of atoms how does it do it it's a marvel it's a mystery yeah. similarly when you see living beings just these four uh, base and 20 amino acids or something how does it create such variety of forms and forms so diverse sometimes you know it's amazing that we share 98% of our genes with the yeast look at the difference <laughs> those 2% genes can create what is this creative energy it's worth pondering about such a big you know in some people have said we are closer to the yeast than to an ape <laughs> genetically speaking <laughs> it's not a good judgment <laughs> because yeast is a fungus though it can be used for something nice <laughs> well we hope we are better than that <laughs> but at least we we should be useful doesn't matter whatever we are we can be useful even that is meant to raise the dow so uh, even when it's most unseen in fact one can say when it is most still it is most powerful it is there stillness is not absence of life shobindo says you will know about existence and truth when you see a rishi sitting on a mountain top alone creating revolutions in the world shobindo himself was doing it you see every animal before it takes the leap it enters into a state of stillness you look at uh, a snake before it strikes and that's why it takes you by surprise because you feel it just lying inert or it just raises its hood but the next moment it just gathering force or you see the tiger or the lion before it leaps upon the prey or runs for the kill it is still it's gathering force in one of the recent interviews we did uh there was this extraordinary moment when this person talked about sri arbindo mother wanted to repair his room and have him move to another room and he said very silent very softly if i move creation would collapse beyond that comprehension beyond and speaking of stillness it also reminds me and i was i was contemplating on that before you came so like each of us in our own way i was remembering how when mukul day came to paint shirbindo so shirbindo gave a permission finally so shirbindo asked like a child what do i have to do yeah he said you have to sit on the couch that's all all right so he sat on the couch and mukul day says i have never seen and such an extraordinary <laughs> yes. he says without batting an eyelid never moved not a eyelid is moving not a muscle is twitching and he is sitting there i just have to do this he asks him this i just have to do this that's all yes and he sits still yeah. this stillness is pregnant with power life is teeming inside and the more still we become the more we become powerful for action and it's uh, at many levels you know um, i am tempted to speak of other things but we'll stop <laughs> otherwise there is no end to the mystery of life housed in the atom buried in the clod her quick creative passion cannot cease in conscience is a long gigantic pause her cosmic soon is a stupendous face so even when there is a pralaya so there is everything is reduced to dust and scattered in space but life is still there it holds all the seeds within itself goes into a state of soon it's like a hibernation but when it bounces back very soon creation emerges with very rich creativity you know this is a this actually happened on earth when dinosaurs died it's very interesting that uh, it was struck by meteor more or less now everybody believes this theory 
and not only it finished dinosaurs, it finished most of the life on earth. It's obviously everything was conterminous. And then there was a period of lull. But when life came, it came with a vengeance. There was such variety, such variety, such variety as it didn't exist in the pre Paleozoic era. It's actually, you know, and if you see it on, uh, you know, time scale motion, mm. it's amazing to see that, you know, there is very little flora and fauna and the dinosaurs are there. And then suddenly. And then they, there is finishing yeah. of everything. And then there is sparkling all over, all over. Everything is getting filled with, it, with a huge variety of species. Yeah. So the cosmic soon. And that's why it doesn't pause. Even death is just a pause. It's not the end. Time born, she hides her immortality. In death, her bed, she waits the hour to rise. So, how beautifully it is. See, this is one of the beauty of Sri that when you read him, it liberates us. After reading these lines, who can have fear of death? What is death? It's just a bed. Life has taken to rise up again. I am reminded of Sri poem, Baji Prabhav. So, you know, he is going to die. He knows it. It's an impossible battle with 50 Maratha soldiers against uh, thousands. Of thousands. Thousands. Some estimate, you know, 10,000. But most uh, conservative estimate also will be 2,000. Now, 50 versus 2,000 is no match. <laughs> Holding a small gorge. And Baji Prabhu is given the task. Now, Tanaji Malsure, who goes to fetch Shivaji and all the arms, knows this fellow is going to die. My friend is sacrificing himself. So he says, I know what's your fate. But I can tell you that when you come back, I'll build such a fire for you, as even the heavens will see. So Baji Prabhu says, Oh, you're going to build a fire for me? You think I'm this 5 feet 6 inches body? He says, don't worry. Yes, I know I'll go. But you don't have to worry about it. I know that you also will come. We'll meet once again there and talk about our glorious deeds on earth. <laughs> it's a very, very inspiring poem. It can raise, I can tell mm. you, I'm not exaggerating. I've experienced it when I was terribly sick, having, you know, on a, on a verge of collapse. And my friend asked me, uh, you need anything? I said, please read Baji Prabhu. <laughs> and trust me, within, uh, you know, I didn't say like this, please read Baji Prabhu. It was totally a kind of, I, I, please. And within half an hour, I was all sitting, propped up, feeling so energetic. <laughs> and doctors wondered what has happened. It can literally make a dead person near dead. <laughs> uh, maybe dead would be, but near dead come alive. So, you know, it has that power in it. it I shows. remember Amita Sen saying, Give me 50 men. Give me 50 men, that's right. Give me 50 men. That's... Even with the light denied, that sent her forth. And the hope dead, she needed for a task. Even when her brightest stars are quenched in night, Nourished by hardship and calamity, and with pain for her body's handmaid, misuse, nurse, her tortured invisible spirit continues still to toil though in darkness, to create though with pangs. She carries crucified God upon her breast. You know, each passage of Sri Aurobindo throws certain images in the mind. And many images. So, one of the images that came to me when I read this passage, there are many other, more profound, but something, uh, I was, my mind went back to India of the 60s, or maybe 70s, and life in the villages, and life of the women in the villages. Uh, I mean, I don't know, many may not know it, but some may understand what I am meaning. Totally neglected, living on scorn. She has nobody who can give her love. Father has sent away. You are no more my baby. 
that's your home in laws you are our servant and serf you have come to take care of us not to you know <laughs> you have no rights and the child if it is a son tata bye bye if it's a daughter she may understand a little bit of her mother's pain nobody to share her agony with but even in that state some of them have created such wonderful human beings i mean it's amazing what power i mean we talk about shivaji think about shivaji's mother what she would have been we miss out on you know these characters how they would have what they had done how they nurtured because it was within them and they poured that anguish that urge that power to create into a child and that's why i feel that bringing into birth a child is also a very creative act it should not be you know just felt oh she is just a housewife i can tell you it's very difficult to be a housewife at least in india it's <laughs> it's far more easy to be a working woman but much more difficult is to be a working woman and a housewife than you had it <laughs> but times are changing but you know if you look at this even with the light denied that sent her forth and the hope that she needed for her task she has no hope the man will never change the man whom she is wedded to in those days he had no hope he will not change his ways he will not mend his ways he will remain what he is yeah. and yet she has to manage things even when the brightest stars are quenched in night nobody to turn to nourished by hardship and calamity i have seen women sleep on the floor with nothing but a small mat while the men were sleeping on beds it's a horror i mean india has a very beautiful side and we must bring it out but we should not shy away from showing its issues and problems and defects which may be last 100 or 200 years so much of parda they can't you know even look at the world properly and yet it's the great dichotomy yeah shakti woman is shakti and shakti and we must bring that out because that's our truth this is our fallen state and that's why shivinda says in durga stroth mother india who lies fallen this is a fallen state she carries crucified god upon her breast what is crucified god there is the divine but he is helpless two thieves lay slain by his side in chill in sentient depths where joy is none immured oppressed by the resisting void where nothing moves and nothing can become still she remembers still invokes the skill the wonder worker gave her at her birth imparts to drowsy formlessness a shape reveals a world where nothing was before so at every plane at every layer at every level it is busy creating this word immured yes locked in confined yes. immured and then oppressed, oppressed by the resisting void nothing nothing is going to listen to you it's a void nothing to share in realms confined to a prone circle of death to a dark eternity of ignorance a quiver in an inert inconscient mass or imprisoned in immobilized or imprisoned in immobilized walls of force by matters blind compulsion deaf and mute she refuses motionless in the dust to sleep so what does she do gives birth to the plant the trees the worm the insect and what beautiful creations she refuses if nothing else will create shells beautiful stones pieces of sand particles grains that will suddenly glimmer there are people who have been rescued out of a state 
dark state simply looking at the water flowing through a river because it contains life inside and there is a moment in which we can get in touch with it and it can help us it's just a question of contact with what is within one of the simplest cures for depression and i can vouch sip vouch for it it's just looking at a flower identifying with itself it is a wonderful healer doesn't charge you any money doesn't give you time for the sessions doesn't have systems in its head it doesn't apply a theory it just lives breathes is that beauty and joy in a small little space and form and you look at it and you get nourished nurtured and feel rejuvenated and sri arbindo's comment that is eternal flowers are the moments representation of things that are in themselves eternal yes and that is why when people say you know now we have psychiatrists and you know i am supposed to be one of them <laughs> it's a irony <laughs> i keep making fun but uh, nevertheless you know now people go to psychiatrist but in india we didn't have psychiatrist for a long time and even now people are hesitant to go to a psychiatrist so what were their resources they either very often you'll say they turn to the gita religious scriptures they forget one thing that in traditional indian homes there were also flowers and i feel it is very good if we can you know get into this habit of keeping flowers in home it doesn't matter you don't have to offer it right before a idol just let the space be filled with flowers it's rejuvenating yes. Yes. it's you know every time i walk back to desire and there are flowers on the road what flowers transformation yeah. so i see them and i wonder look at these flowers they have fallen they are so beautiful they have such wonderful name and they are just lying in the dust with you know cars and everything passes by but they don't uh, fade away just like that <laughs> they resist and they remain there they are such a beautiful sight it is yes and the transformation flower used to bloom in a very specific season to show you the change you can see transformation flowers every day of the year now oh, wow this is a very interesting yes. piece of yes oh wow, this is very interesting and and you are an expert on flowers among many other things i mean but so it's uh, it's interesting to it's, know this it's incredible yes. i mean i didn't know this that and you, you know, see in the early morning when they fall you can stand under the tree and, yeah, they, yeah, and they yeah, fall yeah, on your head yeah. and at night you can pick them up and take them Absolutely. to your house Absolutely. yes so, so few more lines and then yeah. maybe we can stop then for a rebel waking punishment given only hard mechanic circumstance as the engineery of her magic craft she fashions god like marvels out of mud i have seen one such i mean there are plenty of such marvels one such place where you look at the mountain and it looks like uh, the the peak plateau it's a plateau on top it looks like a reclining buddha now it's made out of hard material and you know you must have seen certain rocks extremely beautiful and you wonder i mean kedarnath is is a rock so how has nature created such things shaligram in indian houses it's worshiped shaligram is a stone found in you know depths and you can almost feel that it has a janeu like you know and it's a symbol of lord shiva so how do you how does life create out of such hard material and of course it applies at every level it is its power so even when such material is given she fashions god like marvels out of mud in the plasm she sets her dumb immortal urge so amoeba doesn't die i mean unless you blast it with medicines it reproduces bacteria unless you blast it reproduces viruses <laughs> they keep on exchanging material they are the first forms where there is an incessant urge to live 
Immortality is its first. But as life becomes more and more complex, multicellular organisms die because it's very difficult to hold together the many components of a form. That is a problem. But uh, the simple unicellular organisms can actually indefinitely multiply. So there is very interesting. Helps the life tissue to think. The closed sense to feel. It's because of life. Yeah. If life is withdrawn, then you ask somebody who is in a state of disillusionment, life is withdrawn inside temporarily. And you say, what do you feel? You say, I feel nothing. But that means it's a terrible state. It's better to say, I feel depressed. I feel angry. I am very comfortable if patients say this. Very angry. When they say, I feel nothing, I am a bit cautioned. You know, <laughs> something is amiss. Feel something. You know, there is a yeah. very nice Urdu couplet, I remember. I'll say it in Urdu, then we can stop this, you know, feeling nothing. Uh, the poet says, Kisi Ranjish ko hawa do, ki mein zinda hu abhi. He says, Ranjish is, you know, enmity. He says, your indifference is killing. <laughs> Be angry. I am still alive. <laughs> I will feel you are alive to me. But if you become indifferent, then it means there is nothing. <laughs> so, it says that, you know, be alive. It's the sign of life. But life is there even in that, you know, it makes the senses to feel, the tissue to think. You see, pranayama, it makes the brain energy so much developed, brahmacharya, because simply because uh, it gets transmuted into that, that energy, the, yes. the spiritual energy and the intellectual energy. It's basically the same thing, life. At the base, it is life in matter, which can be uplifted right up to uh, what tremendous feats have been done by people who have practiced these things. And we know Sri Aurobindo Swami Vivekananda's example. Yes. Yes. Flashes through the frail nerves, poignant messages. In a heart of flesh, miraculously loves. To brood bodies gives a soul, a will, a voice. This is the magic and the miracle of life. In this powerful line, in a heart of flesh, miraculously loves. It's a miracle. <laughs> because ask a scientist, it will say it just pumps blood. There are walls, there is circulation. But to ask anybody that who is feeling love, where are you feeling love? He'll locate it here. He'll not locate it here. He'll not say, I love here. Love is here. It flows from the heart. People feel a pang, literally in the heart, when you know they go through dejection or state. The pang is here. The heart takes the brunt. How is it that this mechanical organ, which does nothing but pumps energy and heart is very sensitive to emotions, to excitement, to quietude, to a nourishing energy of love. So in a heart of flesh, miraculously loves. So we'll stop here on page 181.